Okay, thank you all for coming. I, I sincerely appreciate it. It actually means a lot to me that, that you showed up. It's great to see uh, past uh, students of mine. It's very actually meaningful that you took the time to, to come. I, I sincerely appreciate it. So, so actually, so, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I, uh, I, first, I'd like to thank my sponsors, uh, Caffeine and More Caffeine. They've gotten me through this process. Um, in the, thank you for laughing. You're a genuinely good audience. Uh, um, I ran across this advertisement as I was doing research for this presentation, and I thought that it was very appropriate uh, to the topic, is the things we make make us. And I will try to show you how... There is so much truth to this, more than you may actually believe. Um, <clears throat> you cannot teach. Uh, I chose this title uh, not as a commentary on your own individual teaching ability. Um, I'm not that angry uh, parent who is upset about their, their, ch their child's grade. Uh, more... Uh, Sage, I'll make sure you get the, the handout sheet. Okay, good. Uh, this is more, I chose this rather ex uh, extreme title um, more to shock you and to challenge the axiomatic mythology that is pervasive in our society. Uh, unfortunately, this approach will probably raise your defenses and uh, uh, shut down your openness uh, to a realignment of perspective. Uh, and as such, uh, I will actually try to support this radical proposition with as much science as possible. Uh, you can actually uh, assist as well in the process, uh, if you'd like. You can, um, over the, if you need a pen, you can come get a pen. Over the course of this presentation, I ask that maybe you keep your uh, pen like this against your chin, and keep your posture roughly straight forward or leaning a little bit forward, and don't cross your arms over the course of this presentation. You'll be more open to what I have to say. There's actually some evidence to support that idea, as strange as it may seem. Um, let it be clear that I do not possess the high priest mathematical ability um, uh, that, is, that validates most of the research that I will present here. Uh, this means that I am accepting the validity of a lot of the research on faith. And this is, strangely enough, a bit of a, a commentary on actually on science and knowledge. Um, in another bit of irony, I think that the, uh, that the evidence that I will deliver um, actually uh, uh, refutes the, ev the effectiveness of lecture. Um, so it's funny that I'm lecturing on uh, something that's going to refute the effectiveness of lecture. Uh, in no way do I wish to disregard or disrespect uh, the accomplishments of the past. Uh, as you will hopefully recognize, all past history, in all of its forms, is essential for getting us to where we are now. Okay? And so, even though it may sound like I'm you know, saying things aren't true, um, I, I am still respectful of the past. Um, also, I am not discounting the role of genetics. Genetics does play a role. Um, however, it is my firm belief that we assign uh, much too much value to the role of genetics and measures of academic performance. Uh, I suspect that the persistence of the genetic rationale um, is mostly to validate the status quo. Uh, even though uh, the genetic rationale has actually failed to hold up uh, to the scrutiny of science, actually. Uh, I like Dr. Gabor Matei's quote, uh, the genetic argument is simply a cop-out. Uh, which allows us to ignore the social and economic and political factors that in fact underlie many of the troublesome behaviors that we find in society. <clears throat> uh, also, when I use the word function, uh, I do not 
imply that the behavior or the action that I'm talking about uh, is in fact uh, actually performing a function in the functionalist sense. Okay? I will use the word function. Um, the reason why I will use the word function is the word function is as close uh, to uh, what I'm trying to talk about within our shared lexicon. Okay, we have a shared lexicon. Function is the closest word. It is not function, though, per se. Uh, we just have yet to create the language that we need to be able to communicate some of these ideas. Um, <clears throat> none of the ideas that I present here are original. Okay, I am essentially sharing with you a literature review uh, of published research and books. Uh, the majority, most all of the research that I cite here is published in peer-reviewed journals. Okay, so there, that, that brings an element of validity to it, uh, I hope. I have referenced all of my sources at the bottom of each, at the bottom of the slide where the information shows up. In your handout, you'll also see a list of references as well. <clears throat> um, the progression of this presentation uh, was and is extremely difficult uh, for me to organize. Uh, this is due to the nonlinear nature of complexity and cognition. Uh, I fear that my ability to communicate uh, in a way that is linear enough and coherent enough to you, the audience, is inadequate. Uh, in an effort to make my message more accessible, I have chosen a somewhat linear format. We will move from... Uh, the molecular level to levels of cognition that are beyond the individual. <clears throat> okay, so we have a few running themes. I apologize, I did intend to get these translated into Korean, um, but I was unable to find the time or other people who had the time and the understanding to be able to translate these. Uh, I will uh, hopefully you will understand them near the end of the presentation. Uh, I, won't ever, I will not explain nonlinearity. I assume that you can understand nonlinearity. Is that we have a linear, something that is linear, is, a, is a straight, it has a line, it has a definitive progression, whereas something that is nonlinear uh, does not follow a straight line. Okay? Think of it like that. <coughs> you can probably guess what bidirectionality is. Okay? Uh, these themes will present themselves throughout the entirety of the presentation. Uh, I will not always bring them to your attention. Hopefully you can see them uh, where they manifest themselves. Um, I prepared this presentation as an introduction to complexity and embodied cognition and the ramifications they have for education. Uh, this requires a great deal of background information, okay? I'm sorry, okay? It is somewhat technical. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about grasping and understanding each part, okay? Don't worry about it too much. Uh, I encourage you to remain open to the patterns that will hopefully present themselves. The, the kind of, you'll get a feeling for, the idea, for these ideas as they continue to present themselves over the course of the presentation, hopefully. Uh, and final, final caveat, uh, uh, I am concerned that I will come across as a bit of a sophist. Um, I wholeheartedly encourage you to note any portions of the presentation that are unclear to you, uh, that seem unconnected or that seem irrelevant, uh, or any parts that seem inaccurate or deceptive, uh, please. Uh, this presentation is selfishly more for me than it is for you, and thus, and as such, I encourage you to uh, critique me, uh, because that's the only way that I will improve and get better, is through your criticism. So you will notice is on the back of your handout, there is a section for notes and questions, and I encourage you to write questions and pose questions to me and challenge me on my understanding. <clears throat> Come on in. <clears throat> okay. Okay, well, computer seems to have shut down again. Great. So, 
Uh, to ease the cognitive load, come on in. Uh, there are some uh, handouts right here next to Professor Hong. <clears throat> to ease the cognitive load, we need a starting point. Starting points are easy. Um, and given my, uh, uh, my long-windedness, hopefully we will arrive at a conclusion at some point. Uh, I have chosen the myth of truth as our point of departure. Okay? <clears throat> the general myth regarding truth is that truth is fixed and enduring. Uh, truth exists whether we know it or not. It is our job to unearth truth as it is. Uh, the growth of knowledge and understanding is a process of each individual exposing hidden truths that have been there all along. Uh, this myth of truth provides the, the foundation for the paradigm of rationalism, okay? of which reductionism, analytical reasoning, functionalism, representationalism, and its recent iteration of cognitivism are all an outgrowth. Okay? Cognitivism, this is a, a, um, a, a philosophy of, of cognition and of the mind that has existed for about the last 30, 40 years. Uh, cognitivism holds that the mind processes symbols uh, that are representative of the external objective world. Yet, cognitivism's metaphor uh, that the mind is a machine that internalizes information and processes the input into meaningful uh, symbols has proven inadequate, and I will, sh I will show you why and how. <clears throat> Truths change. Humans once believed that the earth was flat. People believed that witches floated on water. Many white people believed, and unfortunately some continue to believe, that the white race is superior to other races. Uh, the concept of zero did not manifest itself until just within the last 600 years. These are, we, these are things that we used to believe were truths but have changed, or that we now accept as being truths. <clears throat> uh, is zero real? Can, do, does zero exist without humans? Does it perhaps only exist because it took root in a human psychological niche during a fertile period of time? <clears throat> Knowledge is in part a sociocultural phenomenon, and because of this, the scale at which truth operates is different than the human scale. I will repeat that. The scale at which truth operates is different than the human scale. And as such, truths often seem static or fixed from the human perspective. Okay? I'll try to show you how truth is not, not as fixed as we think it is. <clears throat> but because of this, that as a result of these assumptions that we make about truth, is then we have uh, this idea of the objective mind. And this objective mind has resulted in a dualism, a separation or distinction uh, within our approaches to mind and knowledge. Cognitivism implicitly maintains that the external world is independent and separate from the mind housed within the brain. The mind internalizes the external world, the external objective world, and then assigns meaningful symbols. Evan Thompson describes this uh, cognitivist position as the outside world is mirrored in a, uh, by a representational model inside the head. This position requires the assumption that cognitive function is primarily symbolic and abstract. And that just, if you're, if you're unable to understand much of this, just understand is that it, it assumes that cognition is fundamentally symbolic and abstract, is that we process information using symbols, okay? I don't agree with this whatsoever, actually. <clears throat> I mean, what are these symbolic representations? How do these symbolic representations bear any weight or meaning? 
This echoes the symbol grounding problem exposed by John Searle's critique of the Turing model uh, via his Chinese room experiment. <clears throat> this dualism that is created in the separation of mind and body, okay, separation of separation of, of mind and, and the physical world, okay, this dualism extends into education. Ornstein and Levine explain that in the field of education, which I'm sure all of you know the, this book very well, uh, perennialism and, and essentialism have long emphasized uh, the instruction of core, core truths to advance civilization and civil society. While very useful, this is all very useful for advancing mankind to the point where we are now. Um, this formalized, <coughs> functional, reductionist, mechanistic approach. But these approaches have shortcomings. Primarily, the shortcoming is the separation. The separation of the knower of the knower and the knower's physical situatedness in the world from the knower's knowledge and the knower's understanding of the world. <clears throat> the romantic and fantastic idea that knowledge is distinct from our physical position in the world and that knowledge can be transferred and communicated uh, via units between bodies is inherently dualistic and thus representational. Furthermore, this position is fundamentally transcendental and it is an illusion. The foundations of our educational system are implicitly predicated upon a transcendental and illusory paradigm. I know you are all very skeptical. Okay? That's okay. I understand. Uh, in an effort to accommodate such skepticism, uh, I think illusions are an excellent tool uh, for helping us ponder how our mind functions when constructing reality. For example, why do we see a human face when looking at Machu Picchu? There is no human face there. And yet, all of you see a human face. Why do we have difficulty looking at this picture of the woman's face with two sets of eyes and lips? You have difficulty looking at this. It's difficult to continue looking at this for a long time. And this points to, again, how we internalize the external world, is that it's this process of, of what we have already experienced in the past. Anyways, I'll, I'll make that more clear in the future. <clears throat> Again, my students, you have all seen this because I've shown you before, is are there blue dots, in fact, uh, on this image? <clears throat> when we look at this, okay, are the circles in this image moving? Are they moving? If we were <laughs> rationalizing reality, the reality of these circles, would they be moving or stationary? Observations confronted in quantum physics uh, let, uh, by Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg, hopefully most of you all know of Heisenberg and his uncertain, <coughs> uncertainty hypothesis, uh, among other individuals, resulted in what has become known as the Copenhagen interpretation. Okay? The Copenhagen interpretation, I think, is, is really, really important to our understanding of cognition. <coughs> In this view, there is the understanding uh, that experimentation presupposes and thus confines an outcome. In other words, the assumptions of the experiment, the equipment used for observation, the structure of the experiment, in part, determine the boundaries of the experiment and thus determine the outcome. Okay? How we structure an experiment determines the outcome of an experiment. If we, uh, and a, a great example of this uh, in contemporary economics, at least, uh, is the argument over GDP and how do we best um, uh, create an economic system that represents really uh, value, 
Uh, and this is, uh, I, I included the uh, quote here from uh, the, the, uh, the king of Bhutan, where he mentioned that, again, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. <clears throat> again, ha how we measure and the equipment we use affects the results. Okay? So if we metaphorically think of ourselves as the measuring equipment, or the measuring device used in constructing our understanding of, uh, of the world, then we realize that we can only understand the world via our situatedness in the world. That's a little difficult to follow, I understand. Uh, if we view this, the external world as distinct and separate from ourselves, then we have failed to accommodate for our position. So again, if we consider the world to be ob objective and, dis and separate from ourselves, then we have failed to accommodate for our measuring device. <clears throat> In slight tribute to the most excellent Pixies song, Where is my mind? I ask the question, where is your mind? Famed polymath Gregory Bateson presented an outline for a reconceptualization of cognition in his varied collection of essays originally published in 1972. Quote, he says, The self, which processes information, or as I say, thinks and acts and decides, is a system whose boundaries do not all, at all coincide with the boundaries of either the body or what is popularly called the self or consciousness. We like to think of our, our mind as being our conscious mind, and it is not just that. The system is not a transcendent entity. According to Bateson, the system is not a transcendent ent entity. The network of pathways is not bounded with consciousness, but extends to include the pathways of all unconscious mentation, both autotomic and repressed, <coughs> neural and hormonal. The network is not bounded by skin, but includes all external pathways upon which information can travel. This leaves us then, oh, sorry, I'll get back to my notes here, actually. Uh, Gregory Bateson's work, along with the work of many others, uh, laid the foundations for a new cognitive approach uh, and study of cognition. This is known as embodied cognition, which is also uh, often known as grounded cognition or uh, inactive cognition or situated cognition, and it's usually or quite often associated with distributed cognition. <clears throat> Evan Thompson states, quote, the central metaphor for this approach is the mind as an embodied dynamic network in the world, rather than the mind as a neural network in the head. <clears throat> this is not to discount the role of the neural network of the brain and nervous system. It is rather recognition that symbolic representations within the neural network fall far short of explaining how meaning is constructed. Again, we're focusing here on the idea of meaning, or how we construct the idea of meaning. Raymond Gibbs states, cognition is what occurs when the body engages the physical world, the physical culture, excuse me, engages the physical cultural world and must be studied in terms of the dynamical interactions between people and the environment. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> cognition is not the representation of an external reality within our mind, but rather cognition reflects our continual, sorry, our continual biophysiological process between the mind, the body, and the environment. Essentially, cognition is bi-directional. It goes both directions, <clears throat> or even multi-directional. Okay? And in this idea is that, the, is that the mind cannot be separated from the body and cannot be separated from the environment at any level without the mind becoming a casualty or without cognition becoming a casualty. <clears throat> If cognition is an ongoing biophysiological process, then the construction of knowledge and understanding is ultimately much more dynamic and environmentally driven and cooperative than we normally think. 
<clears throat> if cognition and knowledge are more of a process rather than a foregone fact, then we need to reconceptualize learning and education, specifically the process, the process of education. In the words of Dr. Bella Ben Afi, <clears throat> there is a growing awareness that our current oh sorry, there is a growing awareness that our current design of education is out of sync with the new realities of the information and knowledge era. Those who are willing to face these new realities understand that rather than improving our education, we should transcend it. Rather than revising it, we should revision it. And rather than reform it, we should transform it by design, um, which I mostly agree with. <clears throat> In their book, Dr. Diane Larson Freeman and Lynn Cameron ask the following questions. Now, they are speaking about language and language learners, but actually I've gone ahead and I've changed their words to speak about knowledge and, and uh, uh, to speak about knowledge and learners, okay? So what if education researchers should be seeking to explain how learners increase their participation in a learning community rather than, or in addition to, and I, I don't really agree, uh, how they acquire the knowledge of the community? What if the process of learning and the agents who engage in it i.e. the learners, cannot be usefully separated? What if knowledge is viewed as an open, continually evolving system rather than a closed one? What if learning is not viewed as static frames, but rather more variably evolving through use by individuals? What if we truly understand that teaching does not cause learning? These questions are a little bit difficult to um, come to fully appreciate without the framework provided by complex systems, okay? So, this gets us to complex systems. Complex systems are responsible for most of the patterns, structures, and orderly arrangements that we find in the natural world, and many of those in the realms of mind, society, and culture. I actually would change this, I would say all, all of the realms of mind, society, and culture. <clears throat> this coupling of complex systems uh, with, or dynamic systems, I'm sorry, excuse me one second. I apologize. I, I, I skipped this part right there. Okay. Well, complex systems allow research as a, a framework for unifying the, the, uh, the work from a wide variety of fields, specifically the hard sciences, as well as the social sciences, okay? This coupling of complex systems with science involves a significant paradigmatic shift in our approach to science overall. This approach to science emphasizes process over structure. It emphasizes holistic contextualization over reduction. At the risk of sounding overly dramatic, I will say that this shift is broad. It's not limited just to the hard sciences. It fundamentally touches all aspects of civilization and humanity. Hopefully you will understand better near the end of this presentation. <clears throat> okay. Complex systems, they are being researched throughout the world. Uh, here is a sample of some of the institutes and schools that are currently researching complex systems. You'll notice London School of Economics, Santa Fe Institute, uh, the New England uh, Complex Systems Institute, which is close association with a variety of, of your Ivy League schools um, up near Boston. <coughs> um, a lot, a lot of, there are a lot of schools and institutes researching this. Uh, Stephen Hawking says that uh, I think the next century will be the century of complexity. Okay, so what is a complex system? Okay, I, this is going to be a little abstract. I know you think that what I've talked about so far has not been abstract. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it simple and quick. 
What we need for a complex system is we have a sufficiently large number of agents. These can be individuals, individual cells, individual people, individual other, other individual systems, unities of some sort. Interactions are primarily local. We have processes of positive and negative feedback. Complex systems operate far from equilibrium. Okay, this regards the, uh, the idea of entropy. Entropy is a perfect balance of energy, which actually equ equals death. Okay, so these uh, complex systems operate far from equilibrium. I'll use the pointer here. Okay, and thus require a constant energy input. We must have the constant input of energy. They exhibit states of relative stability, despite. Oh, wrote the word despite twice there, operating far from equilibrium. These are what we'll call basins of attraction or attractor states. These are, these will be, we are able to recognize some form of stability despite it not being in equilibrium. <clears throat> they exhibit self-organization and emergent properties, are open and thus have difficult to define boundaries, you'll understand better later are nested within and structurally coupled with other systems. So they are, a, a complex system is always located inside another complex system. <clears throat> they exhibit recur recursion, which is self-reference and pattern replication, sometimes within nested scales. Uh, any of you interested in math, you will know fractals and fractal geometry. Uh, that's the uh, that's an example of self-reference and pattern replication, what we call it. 